Okay, well, um, thanks for having me me uh, be here today. Normally I talk to the room of people, but I guess I'll talk, mm -hmm. talk to the computer. Um, so uh, I'm a marine ecologist at the University of Washington, and I work uh, primarily on, on top predators. I've worked in Greenland for about 17 years on, for the most part, whales and polar bears, and have, to, to be very honest, have only very recently started thinking about glaciers and glacial fjords just due to the nature of some of the work we're doing. They've really emerged as important habitats for some of the, these animals. And um, so I'm gonna present some of that, that work to you today. So I'm going to um, first talk about narwhals and I'm gonna present um, just an overview of a paper we published in biology letters as part of a Arctic biota special issue uh, last fall. And this was work I did in collaboration with Twyla Moon, who's a glaciologist that's now at NSIDC and um, a number of other folks listed, listed there, looking at uh, the use of glacier fronts by narwhals in West Greenland and trying to understand a little bit more about their associations with, with glaciers. So I think we'll probably hear a lot about this um, in the next talk, but just in brief, also following on, on what Jackie just presented, glacial fjords can be characterized by um, high rates of productivity that lead to rich marine ecosystems. And of course, the um, high productivity in, 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 in front of the glacier and the downstream regions is attributed to the meltwater. And there's often a strong relationship between the presence of meltwater nutrients and phytoplankton blooms. And so um, they can kind of manifest themselves as important factors for large predators in a number of ways. They can aggregate plankton um, at, at certain sites, but, but the freshwater can also um, stun plankton via like a, a freshwater osmotic shock and make them easier prey. And then of course the nutrient fluxes are used uh, later in the year for, for post-bloom uh, plankton production that lengthen feeding opportunities. So I'm gonna talk about the narwhal. The narwhal is a Arctic cetacean. You can see here, it's uh, global range is shown in red. It's, it's got a pretty restricted distribution and it's found for the most part in the Canadian Arctic and around um, the glaciated regions of, of the coast of, of Greenland, both on the west and east side. So narwhals use glacier fronts and the glacial melange areas in summer. And this is something that's, that's long been known. They are a migratory species and they essentially follow the formation and recession of the sea ice. But in summer, especially in Greenland, they move north and they um, spend a lot of time right in the, in the vicinity of, of glacier fronts. And there's really limited understanding about why whales are present in these areas and, and why they go to some glaciers and not others and, and really the kind of overall drivers of habitat use. So our study was set off to try and, and learn a little bit about that. And this Kristen, is just a, a photo showing you, excuse me? Um, are, are you still on your first slide? On my first slide? Yes, because that's what we're seeing right now. Oh, weird. Oh, sorry. No, I'm not. <laughs> I have a lot of slides into it. That's weird. Um, Let's try. Sorry. That's really weird, sorry. No worries. Um, here, here. Mm -hmm. I wonder what the, what's your desktop? I'm downloading her presentation right now and I can share that. Um, Did that work now? What do you guys see now? We see the first slide right now. It's not in slideshow in it. Oh no. Can we make it small like a Yeah, I wonder. Let's see. It's okay. I got it. What do you see now? Does that work? Now we're just we're seeing you guys. Oh weird. Okay. Huh. It's always something. Yep. Okay. I'm sharing. Um, the PDF version that I have. Okay. Oh, okay. Why don't we do that for now and she can just say change slides and yeah. we'll, we'll work from that. Okay. Um. Sorry, we got it to work but didn't test switching slides, I guess. Let me know where you were. Um, keep going. I think I was, I was right there. Yeah. I was talking about narwhals, right? Now yeah. I, 
I'm remember. sorry for the interruption. <laughs> <laughs> I think, okay, so shall I'll just tell you to change slides. Yep, sounds good. Um, okay, you can change slides. I'll see what comes next. Can I make this come in the front? Uh, so I can see what, no. Uh, okay, so I, I, was just, uh, I was just talking about how, how these glacier fronts are important for narwhals and there's limited understanding about um, why they're present at these glacier fronts and what drives habitat use. Next slide. So uh, this is just a photo to sh just to show you kind of the scale and, and that these whales, they, they travel in groups. They can be small groups, anywhere from a couple individuals up to several hundred individuals back and forth between glacier fronts in Greenland for several months at a time in summer. Next slide. So um, there's been extensive work on narwhals over the past several decades looking at their uh, their migration uh, patterns and the subpopulation structure. And what I'm going to be talking to you about today are the whales that are shown in red, which are um, individuals that spend the summer in northwest Greenland in Melville Bay. And they, um, when the fast ice forms in fall, they migrate offshore, they winter in, in Baffin Bay and Davis Strait, and then they return back to uh, northwest Greenland again in summer. Next slide. So this, um, this paper we did is based on some work, um, satellite tracking narwhals over several decades. The work was based um, for the most part in, in, in Melville Bay. Um, whale, we, we had uh, mobile camps based on a ship, next slide, that were, uh, that were focused on catching whales in nets. So narwhals are, are caught in large nets and they're restrained between zodiacs and um, a satellite tags applied to their dorsal ridge, next slide which basically enables us to track their movements. In this case, we were also able to collect external uh, temperature data during the, the dives that the whales made at the glacier fronts. Next slide. So this is a map of Melville Bay, and what you're looking at are um, the, the locations of whales in the two decades in, in blue and yellow, and then each red star represents one of the 41 marine terminating glaciers in Melville Bay that we looked at in our study. Next slide. Um, so um, essentially what we did is we used these telemetry data, the spatial and, and temporal kind of aspects of those data to build associations of narwhals in space and time with the individual glaciers in Greenland. And you can see in the zoom how the animals are associated with the melange. And of course this varies throughout the range of those glaciers. Next slide. So overall, our objective um, was really to model the glacier and the fjord properties that were associated with narwhal presence or use in Greenland. And so um, we started off on this not really um, knowing what, what mattered to narwhals and, and so kind of brainstorming a list of potential different uh, features of the glacier or the, the fjords that could affect narwhals. And this is just a schematic showing um, some of those different uh, features that we considered in the study. Next slide. So basically, we first used the telemetry data to look at um, different, different metrics for use of, of glaciers by narwhals, so presence, absence, how long whales spent at glaciers, what fraction of our tagged individuals used glaciers at different scales, so there was a sensitivity analysis involved. Next. And then we developed a database um, that described each of those 41 individual glaciers uh, using covariates that we thought could be important to narwhals or were available from previous studies. And so um, this is really based on a lot of work that, that um, Twyla Moon and colleagues at the University of Washington have done looking at glacier width and glacier velocity, the advance and retreat. Uh, we looked at glacier ice thickness using the Operation Ice Bridge data. We developed some covariates looking at discharge um, area of extent and coverage of icebergs in each, at each glacier. We used bathymetry, looking at the front depth from the OMG data set and ice bridge. And then we used models, um, the, the RACMO model, also uh, developed uh, by Ben Hudson to look at subglacial freshwater discharge and sediment flux from each of the glaciers in the range. Next. And so this is, again, just built on work uh, uh, by Twyla Moon, who has used uh, very high resolution imagery to look at changes in front position and develop ways to look at velocity uh, uh, changes of glaciers. Next. So um, I'm going to skip all the, the kind of detailed methods, and they're available in the paper, but just give you the kind of punchline of, of what we learn, learned. 
Um, first is that use of glacier fronts by narwhals has expanded over the past couple decades, and that has been in concert with reductions of sea ice um, in Greenland, so fast ice opening up early or uh, basically whales having access to new areas. Next. Um, so what we, we learned is basically the, the, the glacier height the, um, was significant in, in all models and um, essentially sort of the, the depth of the ice from the, the surface of the glacier down underwater to the deepest uh, you know, possible depth in the area was a really important factor in, in all decades, in all areas. Um, in, 2000s, we, in the 2000s, we also had the front width, width so the, the kind of width across the glacier enter as a significant variable with narwhals using glaciers that had wider fronts. So basically what we saw is these whales are attracted to kind of the biggest, widest, tallest wall of freshwater ice that they can find. And there's a few reasons for this. We, um, you know, it, it could represent an attraction to the freshwater melt because of some of the things I talked about earlier, that it's a productive area and they can find food. It also could be um, something analogous to what we see for a closely related species, the beluga, which in summer is attracted to freshwater um, and, and travels up into estuaries where they molt. And so there could be some component for narwhals that uh, they, um, they need this freshwater for molting and therefore or seek it out. Next slide. So um, we were a little bit surprised to see that uh, runoff, though it was included as a covariate in some of our models, really wasn't significant. And when it was, uh, narwhals preferred low subglacial runoff glaciers. And this basically suggests, again, a higher a preference for higher ambient melt from the freshwater ice over silt-laden discharge. Next slide. Um, we also had a negative relationship with glacier velocity in some models. So basically, narwhals preferred uh, low velocity glaciers. And um, this represents, uh, from what I understand, a combination of speed and iceberg cavity activity. So basically narwhals appear to um, have a preference for lower uh, calving activity glaciers. And in this photo you can see a narwhal down in the bottom left with a calf. And um, it may be that, that basically, you know, having a lower calving activity is a little bit safer or um, less disturbance for animals with, with young. Next. So this is really a broad look, and it was our first look at uh, why narwhals might use glaciers and what's important to them. And of course, this is a, a course kind of geographic assessment. So the, the future work that really needs to be done is, is a better, more detailed understanding of narwhal glacier associations at fine scales, um, looking at um, in, intra and inter uh, glacier variability in and across seasons. Next. So um, I just want to uh, end the last part of the talk with uh, a discussion about the emerging importance of glaciers and glacial fjords to polar bears. And this is, um, again, kind of an area I didn't really expect to be, <laughs> be studying because you just think about polar bears, you use sea ice. But, but what we're learning in Greenland is um, how important some of these glaciers are to bears as habitat for a number of reasons. Next slide. So there are 19 polar bear subpopulations around the Arctic, and those are delineated here with the black lines and the, the labels on this slide. Um, these subpopulations have different ice dynamics. So in some areas, the ice clears out, and um, those are called seasonal ice ecoregions, and basically bears are forced onto land, and they spend a lot of time fasting in summer until the ice begins to form and they can get back out and feed. And in other areas, bears might actually follow the ice. The ice is, is moving um, in a divergent or convergent pattern from the coast. Next. So uh, some of the work I'll talk to you here about is in, in West Greenland in the Baffin Bay subpopulation where we've been tracking bears for a couple of decades. And the general pattern of these bears is they, uh, they use the, the fast and, and pack ice of, of Baffin Bay and, and to some extent Davis Strait. And that uh, area uh, is seasonal. So the ice breaks up and disappears and the population has for the most part moved to Baffin Island where bears stay on land for a couple of months a year. Um, but what I'm going to talk to you about is, again, back to Northwest Greenland, Melville Bay in the, the yellow circle. Next slide. So this is Melville Bay in summer. And what we have seen is an em emerging pattern of, of bears actually using these glacier fronts uh, during summer and not moving to Baffin Island. Next slide. 
So of the, the bears that we have studied in the, in the past five years and, and tracked, which is about 139 animals and about 40, 40 adult females, 18% of these females have actually not, um, not kind of uh, done this, this traditional pattern of moving to Baffin Island, but instead have remained resident at glacier fronts year round. And so this is just some tracking data and you can kind of see the, the glacial outlet, um, outlet circled in red and you can see bears are, are very, very concentrated at these fronts and these data represent in some cases up to three years of movements for individual polar bears. Next slide. So just to keep in mind, you know, bears, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this in a bit, but um, this type of strategy of using of remaining at glacier fronts and in the glacial melange is in contrast to the other strategy, which is to follow the receding ice to Baffin Island and fast for three months. And uh, given the changes we see in in uh, in the annual ice in in that area, we uh, have have shown that the fasting period has actually increased in this region from about 68 days to about 90 days in the last um, last two decades. Next slide. So in, in switching to the other side of Greenland, we are seeing a, a similar pattern, but, but maybe a little bit more pronounced. So the past three years, we've been working in Southeast Greenland. This is a, a part of Greenland that has never been studied um, for, for polar bears. And we've been uh, flying and catching bears in the springtime in the fjords of South, South, Southeast Greenland since 2015. And what we're seeing is that, um, again, an emerging pattern of bears resident in glacial fjords for multiple years and essentially not really using anything other than the glacial ice or the fjord fast ice. Next slide. So this is just a picture of what some of this bear habitat looks like in southeast Greenland. Um, it's a very mountainous area and the fjords will be covered in fast ice and at the end of each fjord there'll be a, a marine terminating glacier with a, a melange. Next. Um, and so here's, here's a photo of, of, of a typical area where we find bears. So you can, of course, see the, the, the glacier front in the background, and then you can see that the, the, the freshwater ice is frozen into that fast ice. And this is a really good area to be a polar bear because um, it makes the, hab the habitat very heterogeneous. Um, there are a lot of seals around the, the areas where the freshwater ice is frozen into, into the sea ice, and uh, bears are, are hunting extensively. Next. And you, we often find very high densities of polar bears in these areas, surprisingly high. I mean, at a single glacier front, we'll sometimes uh, fly into one fjord and we'll see densities of, you know, 10 or 12 bears at, at a front itself. Next. Sometimes also these bears are, are using not just the, the, the melange area and the fast ice, but they're actually far up on the glacier. So we have tracked bears for a couple years now that are resident deep up on the glacier. And, and this is just a, a photo of a, a female with, with two yearlings who, who lived in this area and, and uh, we tracked her for a few years. Next. I had a movie, but I think it's not gonna work because you had the PDF. So we'll just skip, skip the movie. It was a movie of, um, of one of these areas. And, and to show you, we, have, um, we had about a 12, bear, 12 polar bears at this, this front, but we can skip. So other um, important features are glaciers are actually um, facilitate travel. So this is an image, it, it might be a little hard to see on the PDF, you can kind of see um, tracks going up the, up the side of the glacier. So bears use these glaciers as corridors of travel that facilitate their movements between fjords um, uh, during the spring. And so the arrow, you can see there's some tracks of a bear and you might even be able to see a single bear. Next slide. And so we surprisingly track bears very, very far up on these glaciers, um, 10 or 20 kilometers inland up on the ice cap and uh, track them, you know, walking over the, over the glaciers up in the ice cap. And then they, next slide, will actually slide down the um, glaciers to the next fjord. So these, these, these glaciers, uh, sliding is, is truly a form of transportation. They'll slide a very, very long way and, and kind of jump down onto the ice of the next fjord provides them basically um, access to move between a pretty fractured habitat, which is um, you know, not that easy. Otherwise, you have to go out on the fast ice and actually swim around to get to the next fjord. Next. That's just a, a photo of, of tracking a bear over, over the ice cap. Next. 
So um, when the ice disappears in spring and you no longer have the, the fjord fast ice, basically these bears remain on the glaciers and continue to move between them. But instead of using uh, this kind of combination of, of sea ice and glacier ice, they're, they're focused primarily on, on using the, the freshwater ice as a hunting platform. Next. Um, this is a photo. You can see an iceberg with a, a fresh kill from a polar bear and you can see bear tracks and um, uh, sliding all over it. So basically bears are able to use an aquatic stock technique to stock seals that are hauled out on freshwater ice and then of course they can use the ice as a platform for um, eating the seal. Next. And we know that this is occurring in, in Southeast Greenland, um, surprisingly uh, extensively, just even from some, some work that was done by um, the, the OMG survey last fall where they took some polar bear observations and, and it showed that polar bears are using glacial ice during the summer and many of these observations had fresh kills. So they're, they're successful at, at hunting during the summer at this time. Next. So in summary, um, for, for polar bears, uh, glaciers are actually, in, in areas where they're available, I think a, a pretty important habitat for a number of reasons. Um, they facilitate travel as, like, they basically serve as corridors for bears to move between areas. They structure the spring habitat, so this combination of the, the melange and the fast ice provides really good foraging opportunities. Uh, seals spend a lot of time in there and build layers, and so it's, it's, a, it's an area that attracts high densities of bears. Um, they provide a platform in summer for bears to feed, and this is not something we see all across the Arctic. So basically, instead of a, um, uh, a fasting period, bears can use glacial ice to, to find seals. And then, of course, the glaciers influence overall fjord productivity. So, um, so you know, these areas are perhaps not all glaciers, but some of them are, are productive and creating productive feeding opportunities. And I think really thinking... Down, down the road in terms of you know what what we expect to happen in in the Arctic you know understanding this um, this interaction between the the fjord ice and the glaciers as glaciers as habitat for polar bears will be really important next slide um, and that's all I have for you today and the work I presented here is is really a product of work that's been funded over multiple years and decades by by a number of funders so thanks for tolerating the technical difficulties Thanks, Kristen. Yeah.